Welcome to Wine Talks with Paul K. And we are in studio today. It's always available on Spotify, Google Play, Pandora, and all your favorite podcast hangouts. And we are going to have some fun today because we're going to explore the idea of of getting involved in the wine business from scratch. Like, you know, Dave, um, uh, the founder of HP, founded his company in his garage, uh, Dave Packard, and uh, many other companies have started in their garage. So we have Rob Petrie in here. I said it wrong, right? Petrie. Yes, Petrie. <laughs> I mean, most people actually say Petri, but yeah, we say Petri. But I just asked I you, like, how do you say it? And oh, then I, I said, said it wrong. I said Petri. That's... <laughs> I'm 49. When I'm 50, I'll probably have the same kind of problems. Yeah, well, now it's 61. You try that. All right. So we have oh, Rob Petri here. And we're going to have some fun talking about the wine business. We're going to do a flash round with some uh, wine terms, sort of a Rorschach's test. But I, I want to, uh, the wines are gorgeous. So we just tasted them again for the second time. And it's fascinating to me, and I want this conversation to head this direction. Something about how uh, you got involved with this, and, and let me ask the questions, and how we, uh, you know, how it cultivated. You're making 900 cases now a yeah, year, yeah, thereabouts. Yeah. Okay, so uh, many listeners and many conversations I have with people that are fascinated with wine. Wine mm-hmm. is a fascination. I mean, it's kind of a study. It's sort of a, it's a beverage that is like no other. People seek it. They talk about it. They sit on it. I sat yesterday with three total wine geeks, you know, that run a wine shop, wonderful people, but mm-hmm. man, they were like really chewing on the stuff. How does it that you, uh, you, you got started in your garage? I want to know this. Yeah. So, um, it, there was never a, a master plan. It, it just kind of organically happened. Uh, we purchased a property, um, uh, up in El Dorado Hills where we live, which is in the Sierra foothills of California. And, uh, you know, we, we had this spot that we thought would be a, a perfect place to put a vineyard. Um, I was an ag major at Cal Poly. I was always interested in growing something. Ah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah, that's, that happened. So, sure. so we decided we'd put in a vineyard. And, uh, and uh, you know, after, you know, along the way, we, we realized we're going to have fruit here in a couple of years uh, to make wine out of. So uh, we decided to start making wine. And um, we started that in 2007. Uh, we purchased uh, uh, about a half ton of fruit from uh, a winery up in uh, in the Sierra Foothills. We You're going to stop you there. Yeah. Because you've already said a plethora of things <laughs> that you just glossed over. Yeah. Right? So for one, the El Dorado Hills, which is a wonderful gra- grape growing region, but it's mostly Zinfandel usually. Yeah. And then yeah, you, it's a lot of Zinfandel. Did you plant Zinfandel? I didn't. No. But you're the ag major who knew how to do this already and decided to plant against the grain and decide what you plant. I'm just joking. What'd you pl- what else did you plant? What did you yeah, plant? Yeah. So, so the backyard vineyard, I started with um, a Syrah, um, a Tempranillo. A Barbera and a Grenache. So some uh, Italian varietals too. So that's yeah. kind of interesting yeah. from that area. Yeah. So and and they all did pretty well except for the Grenache. I was never really happy with the Grenache. So I were, were you well? Yeah, Grenache is not going to like that area too much. But yeah. were you because you're an ag major and you're looking at the idea of growing things? They're not you know some people have green thumbs and some don't. Yeah. I'm a brown thumb. I kill everything. <laughs> I, I've, I even killed one of those uh, kits for a kid. That give you the gelatin or the the petri type petri type <laughs> stuff, uh, and I can't even grow them then. Like put it in your windowsill and it'll grow prolifically. No, it doesn't when I do it. <laughs> but my brother in law can touch a grape and a grapevine, like I told you about earlier, and it it flourishes. So is that you just like the idea of planting things and watching them grow? That's yeah, I, yeah. I mean, um, my family um, we we like to start. Uh, with everything scratch. So, and we've been doing this for a long time. Like when we make pizza, not only do we make it in our pizza oven, but we, we set up a co-op to, to purchase grains from Montana and we, we, we get 500 pounds of grain and, and mill we, your own we mill our own wheat. <laughs> yeah. We, we put up everything in terms of from string beans to jams, jellies, pickles. Uh, my wife's an amazing cook. And so we just like, we like, um, producing things. It's just something that we've always enjoyed doing. And, and, uh, the idea of a vineyard was just, uh, just too attractive. So you, you, you planted this vineyard, how many rows? Let's just put that way in there. Oh uh, gosh, there's probably about a dozen rows or so, okay, about 170 so, vines. So it's a pretty small vineyard. So I'm, I'm, I'm a young guy or a woman or whatever. I'm not even young. I'm old actually. Let's just say I'm an old guy and I'm trying to explore this idea. And I have a, f- a very close cousin of mine who 
who just moved to Hidden Hills in uh, the valley, mm -hmm. and he's planted some vines, and he is so excited about his first vintage, mm -hmm. so to speak. Okay, <laughs> this is, uh, he listens to this, so <laughs> and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna couch it. You know, I'm gonna say it the way I see it, the way I feel. <laughs> you know, he's like he's, he's a wonderful guy. He is so excited about this vintage. Now it's Hidden Hills in the San Fernando Valley, which. Okay. You know, is it appellated? No. Is it having is it soil? Can, who knows what the soil's like, mm -hmm. right? And he just picked it. It's his mm -hmm. first, the first crop of grapes. So we know how lucky that's going to be. Yeah. But it doesn't matter because it's just something beyond its practical sense. And there's practical, beyond just I planted some grapes and I picked them and I'm going to make wine. There's something about that whole holistic thing that makes people interested and sort of enamored with the idea that I'm presenting my own wines. So, when you planted these vines, you expected to make wine from them. Oh yeah, no. They, we, so, we, how did you determine, for instance, spacing? Did you study this? And like, I'm I'm trying to peel back the details of things that people would not know to think about that decide to do this on their own. Like, there's people in Pasadena that have vineyards on the yeah. hill. You can see them. So, did you think about spacing? Did you think yeah, about the rootstock? Yeah. yeah. So, so I had a number of sources that I was able to speak with during this process. Uh, so. Uh, a client of mine in my day job, um, a guy named Paul Bush. Which uh, most of us have to have when we're trying to get in the wine business. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe two jobs. Right. But uh, yeah, a client of mine, Paul Bush, he owns a Madronia Winery up in um, up in the Sierra Foothills in the Camino area, Apple Hill. Mm -hmm. And so he, he was always a, a great help uh, with questions. Um, I would say most of the consulting I did with my vineyard manager, uh, I hired a guy named Alfonso Alina, and uh, he's, a, he's a vineyard manager from the Sonoma, Napa area. And uh, he was a great resource. Plus, I just did a lot of research online, listened to a lot of uh, recordings about it. And uh, so, and then a big part of it too was, yeah, I got a soil test. And okay, I, so you, I spoke, to a lot, spoke a lot with a lot the of soil scientists. Oh, yeah. You got to peel back. Yeah, I mean, you can't, you can't just throw grapes anywhere. You right. really need to know what you have right. because you really need to match the root stock uh, with, uh, with the soil that you have, right. and, um, and you need to make a lot of amendments. Isn't, I mean, there, isn't there also the UC Davis uh, uh, with the five levels of five zones of heat days? Uh, there's a scale that, oh, yeah. that you use to determine varietals in relative amount of heat days yeah. uh, per year, which is used to quite often depending on the brand. All right, so now you've planted the vineyard. You're, you've, you, are you managing the vineyard yourself at that point, or is somebody else doing no, it? No, Alfonso is still Alfonso's doing that. Alfonso's coming down and doing I, it. I, I get involved, but uh, I, don't, I don't have the time to, to do all of it. So and, the, the, yeah. and you said you've purchased some roots, so you purchased some grapes, which I've done. Now, yeah. I'm going to tell you my quick story about my brilliant business acumen in the manufacturing of wine. I'm brilliant. I'm just really good. I, I buy, I forgot, I don't know why I ordered, I think it was 15 tons of grapes. I don't remember, some ridiculous number. So I made like six or 700 cases right. of Merlot, Mendocino Merlot. Trucked it down to my license. It's been to bottle. We talked about that yesterday. Yeah. And uh, we made an oak age that bought the barrels, neutral barrel, the whole thing, 14 months in oak. It cost me around $22 a bottle to make it, mm -hmm. okay? And I sold it for 12 so that's brilliant, <laughs> brilliant merchandising. But the reason was, and I'm a, that's why I'm going to get to your, your, the retail side of your business here pretty soon. The reason was, the reason is, no one's going to pay me what, let's say, retail margins would make that a $35 bottle on the shelf. Mm -hmm. No one's going to pay me that because they've never heard of the wine. They don't know where it's from. I'd have to go hand sell it somewhere mm -hmm. and try to work the deal out. And uh, in order to move it to my customers, and the wine was great, uh, mm -hmm. I just priced it at a point where I know they would, would buy it. Mm -hmm. And I won't tell you all the reasons why I decided to lose money on it, but um, it's important to know that to start doing this as a brand, and I'm, that's why I'm gonna get to the mm -hmm. success of your volume so far, is that this you're probably gonna go through growing pains like this, right? You're probably gonna find out that getting it on the street is pretty tough. Yeah, it's it's... This has been, this business has been a revelation. Uh, I, I think some of the challenges are, uh, first of all, things I didn't know going into this. Branding is everything. I mean, I knew, I knew branding would be important, but I didn't realize it was everything. And uh, oftentimes the buyers of wines, so be it the retail shop owner, 
um, or the the sommelier or you know restaurant manager, the the guy or gal that's actually making the purchase decision, um, what they drink and what they like mm-hmm. versus what their clients mm-hmm. like and drink are, I would say, ninety five percent of the time, very different. Um, you you will find that. Um, a lot of those, uh, the people that are the buyers, they like balanced wines. Um, they, some of the, the recent styles of super, super ripe wines, most of them are not on board with that, but their, con- their consumers, their customers are. And so to a large extent, they have to satisfy their customers and what their customers look for. So I think that um, getting the sale is not, not always that difficult, but getting the sell through is, is key. It's the hard part, yeah. Because um, unless it's by the glass, um, most people can't taste it. And then they're making a decision just solely based on the communication between themselves and the waiter or the sommelier or restaurant manager, whoever is actually um, commu- communicating That's with them right. about that. And that, that is a tough place to be. Were you, uh, were you listening, eavesdropping on my conversation yesterday with the guys from the wine shop that I was having lunch with? <laughs> oh, I wasn't. <laughs> it was um, exactly that. And, and I, my conclusion with him was, because they are wonderfully educated wine guys, and, mm-hmm. and we're, I, we settled on the idea is we need to sell them what they want, right, the consumer, yeah. and then on our own try to influence purchases on the stuff we like and we think are interesting because I used to have a, I used to have another helper here that used to taste wine with me. And I, sometimes when I didn't, ta- I couldn't taste, it only happened a couple of times. He'd come and taste for me. And then he'd tell me how great these wines are. And I'd taste them. I go, look, I'll never sell this. It's too interesting. It's mm-hmm. too complicated. It requires too much. <laughs> um, Welcome not, to my life. <laughs> yeah. Not, like not too much knowledge, but too much uh, flexibility in your palate yeah. to appreciate the wine. And so, if somebody brings me sometimes a, 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 an RS high wine that I wouldn't probably serve every day at my house, but I'll sell a ton of it mm-hmm. because of that softness that comes with putting sugar in a wine or at least leaving some sugar. So we have to be very careful with that, right? Yeah. Because the consumer's buying. And you're right. It has to be kind of hand sold uh, in some instances. But I think what you're doing and how you're doing it is a great start to, to broadening the horizons of the consumer's looking for interesting things. And this is an interesting story, so I want to continue. Um, so you bought the first... So why did you have to buy grapes the first time around? You hadn't produced on your vineyard yet? Yeah, so I planted in 2006, and uh, the first vintage that I produced at home, just for home wine, uh, was 2007. So, okay, so it, just just too soon. Um, I think we dropped all the fruit that first year. And... Um, and so I needed to find some other sources. So and what are their options? That's a good point. See, every every sense you say is something for me to talk about because <laughs> we're going to be here a long time. We gloss over. <laughs> yeah, we gloss. You can't gloss over that. Uh, I mean, I can't because uh, drop the first vintage. So the idea that you cannot really produce a decent wine out of the f- first, let's say, four vintages or three anyway, depending on the where you're at, but fourth or fifth vintage is where you think the grapes have enough sugar, enough balance, enough phenolic ripeness to do it, right? So we just, so we plant a vineyard and we just, we can't even make raisins out of it, right? So <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, and I think most people that plant a vineyard are typically going to drop the first uh, vintage. Just, we, we want more focus on the plant growth yes. than the fruit growth. Right. No, no different than if you plant an apple tree you know, or another fruit tree, you know, most of the time, I think most people drop those, drop sure. that fruit. And, uh, I mean, the second year you're going to get some, I, uh, I think we might've made a little from the second year, but really the third year is when you start getting a substantial harvest and fourth year is, I think most people would consider that, you know, you know mature, yeah, mature. Yeah. It's and not, not as good as wine. the grape's going to be when it's 12, 15 year old vine, but it's, it, it's good. Yeah. So. Many wineries will bottle those younger, uh, vintages or younger vines as a separate label uh, many bordeaux houses do mm-hmm. that and the wines are brighter and fresher and younger yeah but they're classically made you know so they're good they're very good i have a lot in the stock here yeah or they but, might bulk it off and you know produce yeah, it, and, it right. and sell it to someone else no, that's a really but, good yeah. point yeah there, uh, there is a movement a huge movement today in the consumer side of, bi- of, the, of the wine business that uh, again i had a conversation with these guys yesterday that they're 
the bulk market is huge. It's always been huge. Uh, if you listen to the Wine Institute, the statistics, somewhere around 95% of wine is not bottled by the grower because there are many just farmers, of course, and then there's people that just sell the juice, and then there's people that sell the excess juice. Uh, and many times in my career, we've bought really, really good juice from very, very well-known wineries mm -hmm. and rebottle it. Yeah. And of course, I can't say it's, you know, uh, Dry Creek or anybody like that because there's a non-disclosure agreement with the winery not to disclose, like, hey, I've got Dry Creek Cabernet for, the yeah. <laughs> for half the price because you can't do that. So. Yeah. There are a lot of great wines that are bottled by brands that are not uh, that are not grown by them, and then there's a lot of really bad estate wine too. Right? I own the vineyards and I pick it and I make bad wine. That can happen. Sure. And so the the idea behind a private label is not a negative thing, but you just said it. Uh, there's excess juice. I if I'm a winery, if I'm Petri Cellars, and I have a bumper crop and I pick everything and I make everything, and I know I can only sell. 900 cases, mm -hmm. and I have 1,000 cases worth of juice, I'm going to go sell the juice. And Definitely. It's good, it's good juice, right? I mean, you're, you're going to sell the juice or or possibly uh, bottle it all and then s and sell, sell off shiners. some of it as shiners. Right, right. Yeah, that's, that's Shiners are do. unlabeled bottles. Yeah. So, so you got the grapes. Uh, you, you found a source of grapes. You brought them into the garage. Is this garage sanitary? Or is there oil on the floor? No, no kidding. No. <laughs> I just, it's no, a I, it's a pretty clean garage. I, I don't. Want, I, want I do no automotive vision. work there. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. You so, got the engine hoist on the roof and right. Okay, so. Yeah. So so yeah. We 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 uh, brought into the, into the garage and we actually rented from our local brew shop. A lot of uh, brew shops uh, will actually have equipment that you can rent. Oh, you rent and them. It's, That's yeah, great. it's very okay. affordable. I want to say it was thirty bucks for the day. Wow. Yeah. So pretty inexpensive. And so. Uh, uh, rented a vintage press, which is like the one we actually have on our bottle. Um, it was like truth be told, like, am I turning yeah. a metal thing yep. with a wood basket kind of thing, like the one you have in yeah, your okay. in your in your, <laughs> right. your entry. Uh, so yeah. By the way, I wouldn't recommend using those; they are a pain to use. Oh, so, right, okay. so yeah, yeah that's so, why I have one. Yeah, so we use that, and uh, and uh, well, I'm I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. So so f uh, first first we you know crush the wine. So we rented a, a crusher stemmer. Um, also, thirty, forty bucks from the from the brew shop. Really? Yeah. Well, so you, you can rent enough. that. Yeah, yeah. Very inexpensive, and uh, we crush the fruit, um, and uh, then basically it goes into the vat, and we ferment that. And once it's done the fermentation, then we use that vintage press, and we pressed it then to barrel. And uh, once it, once it was in barrel, then we added the malolactic bacteria and and uh, to. All right. So the the barrels you bought. Are they uh, neutral barrels? Uh, I purchased actually. That was <laughs> so. That was actually, they're like a thousand bucks for new French oak, right? So, so this was actually a thirty-gallon American oak barrel. Really? And it was a, and it was size. it was a new barrel, um, and that was actually ended up being a problem. So we put it in the barrel for seven months, and at that point we bottled it. And seven months in that small format barrel was too much. Yeah, it was like well, plus with American oak being very pungent. Oh, uh, the funny thing was, most people loved the wine. I thought it was horrible. <laughs> uh, it was just you weren't being. They weren't. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe like, they're just like being I'll polite. never tell a winemaker I when they come in here I don't like it. Right? I'll never do that. That just makes no sense. But yeah, <laughs> you like you didn't like it, but then okay. Well, I, again, I don't know the truth. Yeah. But, you know, uh, but it had a very strong vanilla taste to it. And, uh, well, American oak, right? Yeah, so which didn't appeal to me. So I learned something there. Thanks. You know, um, small format barrel, you can't keep it in there very long. Yeah. Uh, after that year, we just went to uh, you know 225 liter or like 59, 60 gallon, gallon barrel barrel. Yeah. So that's interesting because uh, a lesson learned: uh, American oak's much more pungent and, and directive than uh, French oak or Hungarian oak. But you also figured out that uh, it seems to me that you, if you're not in the barrel long enough, mm -hmm. no, it's a part of the flavor because it's only 30 gallons, so there's yeah. more surface, you know, less wine for more surface mm -hmm. area, right? Exactly. But uh, you don't get the softness that comes from extended oak aging. Exactly. Right? Or even a neutral barrel. So now you have probably what's mainly probably a rough-edged wine with a lot of oak in it, right? That's probably exactly. what Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And, you know, the funny thing is uh, I think a lot of times people think that um, you're putting the wine in the barrel to get oak flavor, right. which, I mean, that is a byproduct of that, and, and some level of oak um, can uh, contribute, you know, positively to the, yeah. to, to the wine. But um, if you just put oak, like 
I'll give you an example. Right now, I have a, a friend that had a little Cabernet that he was growing in his backyard, and he asked me, hey, could, I, could you make some wine out of this for me? So <laughs> I really didn't want to, but I did anyways. And we're talking about 10 gallons worth of wine. Oh, right. so, 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 you know, so what do you do to, to give it the oak? Now, you can buy oak staves or oak cubes that are toasted that you can put in there, and that'll impart the oak flavor. But what it doesn't give you is because there's very little surface area, it doesn't give you a lot of that interaction with the oak. It right. doesn't give the exposure, that slow exposure you get of the oxygen when it's in barrel. So the barrel, really, that interaction is really what helps to uh, integrate with the tannins and soften the wine and, and make it beautiful. And, and it gives a little bit of oak, too. So. You know, it's interesting because people don't realize we had, uh, had a wedding in my home over the week, two weekends ago, three weeks ago, and we brought over some barrels. All the barrels that I bought for... Mm -hmm my Merlot, which were neutral at the time, uh, they're starting to, the staves are starting to come fall off okay. because the, the wood's drying mm -hmm. and the barrels need the moisture to stay expanded and, and sealed. Right? Yeah. And my, and my wife's like, wow, the barrels are falling apart. And I said, yeah, that's, they're gonna just eventually just crap out on you like that. So, uh, so here's a great story, right? So you spent especially here in Southern California yeah, where right. it's, it's dry. It's dry. The it's not like, like you live in Hawaii, right. but <laughs> so it's, you're, You've learned a lot of lessons already. Uh, you've you built you've, in the first bottle you didn't care for. It. People may have just liked the over oak of the other one, and so what did you do the next year to to combat that? And oh, I'm sorry, I had one other question. You you the yeasts you used? Did you and you bought these grapes? They were trucked to your house. Is that what happened? Uh, so so my vineyard manager dropped off a, a half ton like macro bin back of the station wagon. Just uh, yeah, so to speak. <laughs> pretty much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so. Did you use the, nat the, the native yeast, or did you inoculate it with some? No, I, I inoculated it with some yeast. So how did you decide, you know, again, a question that somebody would have to answer for themselves if they're to do this? Did yeah. you get the catalog of yeast out and start picking one, or did you just go by somebody's suggestion? Yeah, I don't remember how I chose that, that yeast, uh, but typically what I'll do is uh, I would go onto a website that I've used, uh, more wi morewinemaking.com. Uh, they're in the East Bay of California, and they, they sell a lot of different yeasts. And uh, I'll t typically find something that uh, fits my situation. I mean, and, and you can be, depending on your complexity of winemaking and uh, abilities and your ability to test the juice, you know, sometimes um, uh, it's going to direct your decision. If yeah. you want to keep it simple, there's, there's a lot of just pretty standard yeast that if, if the sugar uh, or the bricks uh, in the must is not too high, you have a lot of choices. Yes. If you, for example, have a, a very high bricks or high sugar wine. Which would be what, 26? Yeah, if you, if you had a 26 or 27 bricks, I mean, you better make sure that you have uh, a yeast capable of hitting 16% and not right. not dying out too early, right. okay. or you're going to so, end up with a, a sweet wine. Let me explain that to the listeners. So he's talking about the sugar level, which is a, a metric called bricks. When you pick a grape, it's, you know, one of the metrics is like around 23 or 22, right? That's the sugar content of the, of the must. But when it gets to 26, 27, you're going to get a higher alcohol wine if you have the proper yeast to get a, to, dry, to a dry wine. Exactly, exactly. You, you have a couple choices. There's, um, if, if you're looking to produce a high alcohol high alcohol wine, um, then if you find a, a, a yeast uh, that's a very tough yeast, probably the toughest yeast would be like Uber, Uber Firm 43. And I mean, that'll finish so anything. So that's, that's sort of the DNA of the yeast and how strong it is to survive yeah. the fermentation process. Exactly. Right? Because I mean, there's um, the yeast exper experience uh, alcohol toxicity. Yes. And so th they have a tough time in it too. So, so you could go with a, a yeast that can that can survive those high uh, sugar situations, or what you can do, um, and uh, is is when you actually crush your uh, your fruit, um, sometime in the next hour two hours, you can pull off a saunier. You can remove some of the clear juice from that yes. crushed up slurry, which we call the must. You can remove some of that clear juice, uh, which would be a sweet you know sweet juice and then replace some of that with water, which would bring down your sugar level. Ah, I see, okay, so, hmm, I'm not, Sanye. Yeah, okay, so so let's say on typical, our cab, you know, if you look at the our juice, once we have crushed it and soaked it out for say a day or two, so that the sugars have all 
in the skins and everything have all assimilated. Let's say that um, that bricks is uh, 27, uh, 27 bricks. Um, that's going to produce um, uh, probably something in the 15 and a half, 16 percent. Which is high. Alcohol. Right. Exactly. We're still in. So what we typically would do is um, once we've crushed it, uh, let's just say we have, um, you know, 100 gallons of, of must. We may remove five or 10 gallons of clear juice because it's not red yet. Right. Because it's Skin just... It hasn't macerated yet. Exactly. We're going to remove five to 10 gallons or maybe five to 10 percent of that clear juice, okay? And then once we've come up with all of our calculations in terms of our additions, then we can add back in a little bit of water I see. to bring I down see. the sugar. Sugar so, contest down, alcohol gets down yeah. 14. So in a normal situation might be that we remove 10% of the juice, yes. but add back in three to 6% water. So, so we've accomplished a couple of things. Number one, we brought the sugar down but also the remaining wine is going to be more intense because the skin to liquid ratio has changed. Yes, that makes sense. So you have yeah, that, that much more sense. intense right. wine. Color will be brighter or deeper. Yes. So if I'm starting out thinking I'm doing this and I'm not using a kit from, you know, what was the name of that white website? Uh, more winemaking. More winemaking yeah. com. Yeah. Uh, I may not know this. Right, I may not, I may understand the idea of bricks. Uh, I may understand the idea of you know the alcohol resulting alcohol content, but I don't really understand it totally. And so I'm setting myself up maybe for a big problem when it comes out of the bottle yeah. because I haven't really studied all this. In other words, it's not just I'm gonna buy some grapes, throw some yeast on there, and then see how it goes. Like like you, you did in high school and you tried to ferment some orange juice, you know, and make some alcohol. Or you just took it from your dad's pharmacy like I did. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, not that we all, endorse that practice no, to not. any underage viewers, which there should not be. <laughs> I actually, I actually exposed to my father uh, on, a, on a podcast a few weeks ago that I had uh, used to take half pints of vodka, and at his store. When as a delivery kid, you had to show the manager on the way out the door how many bottles were in the order. So if it's two yeah. bottles of Jack Daniels, a bottle of this mixer, there's three bottles. And he'd count three bottles. But he didn't see underneath the false bottom the two half pints of vodka I put there. <laughs> From your own father's store, okay? So my dad goes, my dad's 91 now. He goes, no wonder we were short when we were doing inventory. <laughs> Employee theft is a problem. Exactly. It's a problem. <laughs> Even when they're related Even to you. Even when they're related. So, <laughs> so, um, it's also the argument that you're making there that's interesting because uh, there's lots of conversations going on about uh, dry farming and all this other biodynamic, organic, and sustainable farming, which is all great stuff. But the idea of using natural yeast or the yeast that's on the skins when the grapes come in from the vineyard, they may not be strong enough to sustain a full, uh, a full fermentation, and it's a very dicey thing to do sometimes. So that, That's true. Yeah. When you, but I'm fascinated by this catalog. I've just only heard about, it, I've never seen one. The catalog of yeast, because uh, particularly with white wines, you can say, "Well, I want that that uh, tropical banana character, so I'm going to use this yeast." Or I've got this other character. Is that a, on the red side? Did, are there characters that they present in the yeast catalog that say, "If you use this yeast, these are the kinds of flavors that are going to evolve." Yeah, so you see a lot of different claims made uh, on the different yeasts. Um, one would be different uh, um, sensory, both aromatic and uh, and taste, uh, as well as uh, the viscosity of the wine mm -hmm. and other things like that. Um, again, over the years, uh, talking with and listening and reading a lot in this area, um, it's really mixed on your red wines, especially you say your bigger red wines, like say a Cabernet or a Merlot, how much, how much impact three, four, five years down the road you will get from that yeast in terms of the, the flavor profile. Um, mm. Again. As it ages. Exactly. I, I would say on white wines, it's going to be more noticeable, maybe on like Pinot Noirs, uh, wines like that. But I would say that, again, that's a debated thing. Um, so um, it's interesting because yeah. I, I hear about it, and I've there's a whole marketplace around native yeast, and I think that's interesting. But I also hear these guys like you're not going to screw up your crop and not be ready to inoculate with purchased yeast if you're about to lose it because the for the natural yeast. 
Yeah, I mean, I think what 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 some winemakers will do is they may start with native yeast, um, yes. and then you know halfway through or towards the end of the fermentation, they'll they'll add a uva fern forty three or some some workhorse yeast to make sure it finishes, and uh, that's something that uh, that is done. I mean, so typically much- our, on our wines, we inoculate at the beginning. Yeah, and uh, but it's, I think that's probably that's standard. A, that's pretty. That's pretty, pretty normal. Standard, yeah. yeah. So how much wine came out of this first 30-gallon barrel or plus, I don't know how many 30 gallons you had, but how many, uh, if 30 gallons would be uh, roughly what? 150 uh, bottles. Yeah, right, so 12 cases or so. Yeah, yeah. How much did that cost you per bottle? Do you remember? Uh, let's see. I uh, mean, straw dollars, not stress, headaches, uh, fights <laughs> in the family, you know. Uh, fortunately, not a divorce. You're always in the garage. What are you doing in there? No. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that was, I bought that fruit from my vineyard manager from a property he owned. I think I paid about, it was pretty inexpensive, about 700 bucks for a ton. For ha- it was half ton. Half ton. And then I paid, at the time, the barrel was about 300 bucks. So about 1,000 bucks plus, you know, some additives and stuff like that. So I was probably... Less than and with renting the equipment, maybe eleven hundred bucks. So, so to, divide bucks that by ten bucks a bottle, yeah, something like that. Yeah, a little less. So yeah, I got to do business with you because it cost me twenty two, but yeah. <laughs> it was well, drinkable. <laughs> this was the garage, so the labor was free. There was no workers' compensation. There and was, what did you do with those one hundred forty four bottles? Uh, we drank it. You just drank it. Yeah, right. gave it gave it to friends, family. Um, in in the United States, uh, I believe the number is you can produce up to two hundred gallons a year of wine for your own personal consumption. Yes. So, this, so lessons learned. You moved to vintage number two. Is this now your grapes yet? Uh, no. So, so vintage number two. I think we may have done some. We may have blended it into something else that we were doing. But uh, the main thing I did was a Napa cab. So a friend yeah. of mine is uh, Mark Jessup. Um, oh yeah, sure. Yeah. So uh, and he's a well-known winemaker in in, uh, in the Napa area, and he had a vineyard in Coombsville that uh, he hooked me up with a um, uh, half ton of grapes. And uh, actually, it was, what was it? No, it was a ton. Uh, t- t- was it a ton of grapes? I mean, uh, I, don't I mean normally, Napa, yeah. Coombsville, a ton of grapes would be very expensive. Yeah, it was, it, it was a half ton. Yeah. 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 So, and we made a Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignon, which I'm, I'm down to my That's last amazing. three bottles. That's and it, amazing. It was spectacular. Yeah. Um, and I did that in a 60-gallon uh, barrel of Hungarian oak. Yeah, Hungarian oak. House. Yeah. At the house, yeah, and, and I like the Hungarian oak. It was it was good. Now, when you're doing this at this level, are you um, are you able to like uh, tell the cooper, the barrel maker, look, I want medium toast? You just buy it off the rack. Is there uh, such a thing of buying a barrel? So off the rack? actually, I just bought this barrel from from Mark. This was what he was oh, so primarily using that using. year. Okay, yeah, and uh, but yeah, you can buy a single barrel and you can uh, get different toast levels, and uh, that's that. That's something that can yeah. be done. And yeah. they're about $1,000, $1,200, dollars for free. Yeah, yeah. Typically, you're right now, um, 2020, you're about nine fifty to $1,250, 1300 so for a barrel. For, want, for, for a French oak. Right. American for French oak. So you're talking about 950 bucks. I just want to peel this metric back for the listeners. It's a barrel 60 gallons approximately, and that's, uh, that's around what... Uh, f- 25 cases, yep. something like that. 25 cases. And uh, yeah. you get how many uh, vintages before it becomes neutral oak? In other words, oak that doesn't do anything except uh, sort of soften things. So the, the character that you were talking about earlier that imparts in the wine, it's like, what, two vintages maybe that you get yeah. some kind of character? Yeah, I mean, the first vintage is, is going to the be the, one. the biggest hit. Maybe a good way of thinking about it that maybe would kind of, another way of looking at it would be uh, let's just say you're spending a thousand eleven hundred bucks for a new barrel, a once used barrel. Okay, so a barrel that's had one vintage in it, and let's say for Cabernet, for example, that would be typically twenty twenty one months in barrel. Yeah. You can buy that barrel for then two hundred fifty. Two hundred bucks. That's what I paid for mine. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so you think about it. Most of the punch is gone. Yeah, right. Um, but uh, it's that that still second use is still a, a yeah. really nice barrel, and and. You know, you think about it, it's it's good to use newer barrels. One of the things that, you know, that is true is people like to call things neutral, uh, which that is the norm, that, yeah, the word term, that we yeah. use. But if right. you think about it, there is no neutral barrel. Well, there's, a glass is yes. neutral. Stainless steel is neutral. Right. It's always contributing to something. It might be good or bad. Right, so. sure. You throw a bunch of popsicle sticks in there and you probably have to <laughs> So we're going to fast forward to the first vintage of, of wines from your vineyard in El Dorado. 
Are we doing that today? Are you just sell, are you farming those and selling them, or are you making wines? From no, them? that's just our home wine. That's just for fun. Yeah, exactly. I think we did uh, our first full vintage on that was two thousand nine, and uh, yeah, that was it was, it was kind of interesting. So it was a blend of Bar- Barbera, Cabernet. No I'm kidding. So yeah. so now then all the wines that you're making at the winery. So okay, you've decided now that this is pretty fun. Mm-hmm. You know, I, maybe I can make a go of this and uh, and still remain married, and then. I'm going to invest in um, a license, mm-hmm. which is, uh, what are they, six grand now? Do I get O2, something like that? I don't remember. Seven um, grand. The, the O2 is actually pretty inexpensive. Um, and the California, I, I forget, it might be a little bit more, but um, I, think, I think it was with my consultant and the licenses were you know, 3000 4000 bucks all in. I got to find, you know, I'm there. learning a lot here because it cost me like six. So I got to find oh, They saw you come in. I got to find new consultants. You show, you show up in a crappy car. You yeah, probably showed up in a, yeah, my in, fancy, a, a fancy, uh, Buick fancy Enclave, Escalade yeah. or something like that. <laughs> so so uh, you got an O2, which is the designation uh, for the listeners of California's uh, license. Uh, California license to make wine must hang at a, at a facility that makes wine. So you don't have to own a facility yourself Correct. to have a winery, to have a, to manufacture wine. And many, in fact, I would say probably most of them don't, right? You just, yeah, I think we're been the bottle. There were a hundred licenses hanging. Oh, there's hundreds of wineries in, in Napa like us that would be considered an AP uh, O2 license, right. an alternating proprietor, right. where you basically rent space from from the uh, the the company that owns a the facility, uh, they provide labor, and uh, and uh, you you use their equipment. And you know the great thing about that is you can be using state of the art equipment, and you don't have to produce ten thousand right. cases a year. That's right. So, what's interesting because the dream, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the vision that I, that most customers would have if they walked into my store today, if I want to own a winery one day, would be this huge chateau, you know, either in France or somewhere else or in Napa. And which you know, some of the architecture in Napa is just like gaudy, ugly stuff. But whatever, you're kidding. <laughs> that's a personal opinion. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like that's what it means. And so here we are, like, well, we're going to rent some space, and we're going to pay a premium to do that, really. And but if you try to amortize the cost of the vision, yeah, you know, there's no way you're going to come close to the le- how le- inexpensive it is to do it the way you're doing it and the way I do it. But um, so now you've 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 taken on this license, you're hanging at a facility that allows you to do this. And now you're going to buy, now you got to find contracts for grapes and you do that and you truck them mm-hmm. to the facility mm-hmm. and they get crushed. So who does the crushing for you? Do you do it? Are you there? Are you managing it? Or do you use the on-staff winemaker or your own wine, which by the way, just so people know, you can use the winemaker at the facility or their team, mm-hmm. or you can bring your own in if you want. Yeah. So, which do you yeah. do? And, so, and, and different places do it differently um, uh, in terms of the amount of involvement. Um, there, I would say, like, for example, at the Wine Foundry where we work out of, um, and, and a lot of the places, you're going to have your own winemaker. So, they have a seller sta- a crew, yes. and they have somebody that manages that crew. But, um, you know, oftentimes you're going to have your own winemaker. So, uh, so we have a, a winemaker that we hired, a guy named uh, Kurt Nisnik, and he, um, and he works with, with that staff to, to produce the wines. So, uh, and we're involved in, in parts of it. We're, we're, we're there typically at Crush. Um, uh, the first, uh, the first, uh, first couple of years we were actually using the kids to do some sorting <laughs> actually the first year we we didn't but i think the second or third year we did um now so we that, just what do they call that you know now they have these electronic sort tables with digital things that look at the grapes and spit. is there a name for having your kids do it <laughs> i don't know <laughs> yeah it's called free <laughs> yeah it's called free and look kids i want the little berries that aren't that aren't dark you know yeah yeah so so, uh, so how we're doing it now is the, um, you know, the, f- the fruit is uh, destemmed. Okay. So, you know, ideally we don't want to crush it. We just want to destem it. Yes. So first, first it, uh, it's dumped in, uh, you know, the forklift dumps it in and it goes on this little line and, you know, we're just looking to see if the, any bunches look real funky and nasty yeah. and you know, we'll toss those or you never know what you're going to find. You can find batteries, you can find... Oh, I've burrito heard wrappers and yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. It can be it can be all kinds of things, you know. Uh, that's why if, if you're drinking cheap wine, by the way, they're not doing most of these processes. It's just yeah. getting dumped. Yeah, right. No questions asked, yeah, and it's in there. So, um, and keep in mind, most of the fruit, like in Napa, is harvested at night. 
so you know a lot a lot more things can end up in yeah, there right, that you so don't want in there right. you know so so basically it's bunch sorted just kind of uh you know quickly and then it's uh it's destemmed and then it goes through an optical sorter which literally sends these berries flying through the midair at like 35 miles an hour. That's crazy. I've and, seen it. and these little optical sensors evaluate each berry and if it's too green or if it's a raisin based on the parameters that you've adjusted, you can be more or less aggressive and it rejects it by a little shot of air knocking the berry out of the air midstream. It's, it's a crazy. F- it's a phenomenal piece of equipment. Yeah. And you know what's crazy? Here's a, here's a, here's a funny thing a lot of people don't know, I think is this technology. Okay, I, like I said before, I was an ag major at Cal Poly. And uh, you know, back 25 years ago, I went to Frito Lay uh, in the Central <laughs> Valley. They had this Everybody technology this. back then to do the same thing for potato chips. And at, at the time, really? I, I don't know how long they've been doing it before that. And you'd see, you know, millions of potato shots flying midair, and you just hear ding, 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 knocking out the brown ones that That's have been interesting. Yeah, so it's not really new technology now. Uh, they probably rebag that and call it something else. Yeah, well, they it's, you know they they basically you know turn over the wine industry, charge them more, and <laughs> and it's really the same technology. I'm sure the technology's gotten better, um, but it's it's not new, which is that's hard to believe they were doing that 25 years ago. It is hard to believe that because yeah. the the machine I saw seemed very sophisticated. Yeah, yeah. So this is. Um, there's, I would say, uh, more and more wineries are using this. Uh, there's a lot of benefits, not only can increase quality, but one of the other advantages is, um, it can move, it can move the line faster than if you're doing really detailed sorting. Yes. Right. So you you said two things that triggered tangent thoughts. One of them is the sorting line because, and having your kids do that, my uncle, used to design recycling lines. And so he said he would not believe what people put in the recycling <laughs> bin. And they dump it on this thing and try to sort it out. And it's like some of it's disgusting. It was like crazy, crazy stuff. Uh, but then he also said this potato thing. Have you seen this recipe? Totally off the subject. But there was a recipe online the other day uh, during Thanksgiving and Christmas for a Cheetos flaming hot coated turkey. <laughs> no, I've not heard of that Does that one. sound disgusting? Sounds like America, circa 2020. You know, what do you serve with that? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> besides... <laughs> malt, because, malt beverage. Yeah, <laughs> when you were talking about the alcohol content of uh, high bricks uh, must, um, <clears throat> you know, Adam Carolla, the comedian, um, he's a comedian, L.A. comedian, and he's also a prolific podcaster. He does a lot of documentaries on racing as well as... He has one out with Dennis Prager now on on the First Amendment. <clears throat> Brilliant guy. Um uh, I love Dennis Prager. <laughs> yeah, so he they, he and Adam Carolla did a, a okay. thing on it's out in the movies right now on the circuit. But it's uh, he takes so he does it a little simpler than than what you're doing. He takes some wine base, some nice wine base, mm-hmm. and he throws in some brandy and then some flavoring agent. And he calls it Mangria because he used to have a show called the Man Show, a very okay. popular show, yeah. and the, it's pretty good. You know, if you that kind of drink, if you're into that kind of drink, it's mm-hmm. a fortified. Flavored sangria. Okay. okay. So maybe just forget the must and stuff. Just throw, throw some alcohol in there and forget it, right? <laughs> All right. So um, you you now have officially started sort of making wine with a license. And what's that? I, I think it would, to me, and I when I watch the sorting line and I watch the, the, crush, the uh, grapes come in from harvest, it's pretty exciting, to see these grapes and this idea, particularly if, you, if you're if you growing them or you know you're going to make wine from these things and it's going to be your product and it's going to represent who you are and, as a winemaker mm-hmm. and an entrepreneur, um, I would think it's pretty exciting you know, just to watch the process and be there that it's going to be happening. Is it sort of a, a, f- a fork thing going on there? It's my favorite time of the year. Is it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Whether the it's the garage or whether it's at the winery. I mean, I mean, the home winemaking still is endearing because it is it is just the family. But yeah, yeah the, it's... It, it is an exciting process, and you know one of my favorite smells is the fermentation. Yeah, right. Once it gets going, I'm I'm as happy as a clam, and just literally tasting it. I think a lot of times people have in their their mind that fermentation is this very long process. It's not. It actually happens very quickly. I mean, an, a lot of fermentations can be, and I'm not talking like a barrel fermented Chardonnay, but I'm talking like a, a Cabernet or yes. Pinot. I mean, it happens in a week. So from day to day, the flavor change is um and, and literally you start out at, at 25 percent sugar 
And within a couple of days, you're down to, you know, 15% sugar and a couple more days, you're down to two, 1% sugar. Wow. And then a few days to finish off usually. Yeah, right, but yeah. Uh, yeah, no, it's an exciting, exciting time. That's really exciting. You know, the, uh, it leads me to this conversation, which I've had many times and probably some of my friends that listen to this are tired of hearing it, but it's a very important piece of the wine difference between booze, vodka, uh, beer, or anything else. In fact, the one winery was in here recently sold me some wonderful Tempranillo. I mean, couldn't believe this stuff was 2010. I love Tempranillo. And, and he, <laughs> he just got out of the business. I think it's Paso. He got out of the business. He goes, I make cider now. He goes, it's easier, and you can always have an apple. There's always an apple around to, to ferment. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, that's true. And it's not so much pressure. So you got out of the wine business. But sitting on this wine for nine years is really good. So I was very excited to get it. But S- Cider making's fun. I, I make cider at home, Do too. you really? Hard cider, yeah. Do you park your cars in the garage at all or no? Because um, it seems like there's taken up by we have apple. we have we have a couple of very large garages. So. Apple <laughs> apple bushels in. We don't make a lot. This is just primarily for my wife. Um, it's uh, if I can get a good deal on that on the apple juice from uh, Apple Hill, I'll, I'll I'll make some. And it's uh, it's a pretty easy thing to do at home for most people. You get a little champagne right. yeast. And, so you do both. Yeah. Let, me, let me ask you this question, and I'll rephrase this so that people <laughs> that listen to this don't say, "Hey, he says the same thing all the time." And that is, if you took a bottle of cider to Europe to visit your long lost relatives and you took a bottle of wine, which one would represent the beverage best, the area, your lifestyle, your philosophy, the things you do for a living, which one would impart your personality more, the cider or the bottle of wine? Oh, I'm. I'd say definitely the bottle, bottle of the bottle wine. wine. Yeah. Right? So, yeah, yeah. what other the cider? Products? That's a small little little cider. Right, but it's not it's yeah. not terroir driven necessarily. It's certainly yeah. grape. I mean, I'm not yeah. grape, but apple driven. If you got to if you ferment a, a green apple versus a gala, it's going to taste differently, right? But yeah. Um, but the idea of terroir, personal philosophy, personal growth, personal ideas, uh, where it was grown, why you chose it, why you bought it. When you're picking your own grapes, it's obviously more pertinent. But even when you go to buy grapes and you want to buy the grapes that you want to buy and you want to get them from the soil that you want your wines made from is a representation of a whole lot of factors as opposed to a bottle of cider or a bottle of booze, which is nondescript in that regard. Oh, um, definitely. Um, with that being said, and this I'll get on my soapbox here, I would say currently in the state of, of, of wines, at least here in California, there's less of that mm-hmm. because um, so many of the wines are being produced with a very monolithic, you know, they're they're shooting for a certain taste that they believe the consumer wants. And so you lose that. But yes, if you're making wine in a more traditional manner and you're not picking the fruit, you know, very, very ripe, or I would say overripe, uh, then that's a huge impact. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that site, that location, um, uh, the climate, um, all that stuff really factors into to to what you get, and and it, wine is very distinctive. Yep. You know, much more than than anything, fruit. Yeah, anything. You you don't get excited about picking up uh, a pineapple in Maui versus Lanai or you know uh, any other country. You get excited about the wines, and they represent so much. And the, one girl put it. One winemaker put it very eloquently. She said, "What other product can you take around the world, bounce place on the table, and say this is who I am? This yeah. is what I'm about." So, uh, we're actually, this is, we could go on for a long time. I, I maybe I have to do this again. Um, but I'm going to throw, I'm going to do it like a Rorschach's, uh, of, an audio. I had to look this up. Rorschach's, right? Rorschach. Isn't that what it is? The, you know, they, I think they, that's what you it know, is. They show yeah. you the picture and it's like, <laughs> you're supposed to say your first thing on your mind. Let me give you a word. Yeah, those wine. are the, the, the ink things yeah, or the whatever. Ink blots, okay. right? I had yeah. one psychology class. So I'm gonna do yeah. the I'm gonna do the same thing with wine terms. And I just want your first impression. And negative positive doesn't matter. One word, sentence, paragraph, what are yeah, we looking at? Yeah, sentence. Fine. Okay. Explanation. Okay. okay. Screw cap. Convenient. Convenient. I like that. I love them. Yeah, and no, I think because there's... I have to taste yeah. 75 wines on a Tuesday, <laughs> it's a pain, <laughs> pain in the neck to uncork 75 wines. Of course, yeah. I make Steve do it when he comes. It doesn't matter. Exactly. <laughs> do you use them? I don't. Um, there's, I think there's, there's definitely a consumer perception still that that there, there's a, some quality limitations with that. I mean, whether that's true or not, I mean, I think that could be debated, but it's not something that we've done at this point. I think part of it too. Um, 
if you're doing a very high production and you're doing a lot of wines, then it's more economically viable than if you're just making very small amounts. Yes. Where right. there's it's there's a lot more involved in that. So Sommelier. Uh, our bread and butter. <laughs> 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 yeah, they're they're they're, they're uh I That's, really like working uh, with most of the sommeliers that I meet with. We usually have very similar ideas on, on, on wine, and uh, these are very passionate people. Um, and they're, they're on a different side of the wine industry. I don't really see myself as in the wine culture. Yeah. You know, I know I have, I have friends and clients that, you know, they know every winemaker, every winery. I mean, you do, of course, I'm sure, because it's your business. It's different but, for me, though. But... But it's not, I'm not part of the culture. I mean, I love drinking wine. I love making wine. I love the entire process. I love selling wine. But it's, um, it, to me, wine just isn't about brands and labels and the who's so, who of the winemakers. It's so much that's more That's a really that. good point. And I think the, 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 and the sommeliers are a very important part of uh, the industry. But the term sommelier doesn't mean a whole lot it, in the sense of a definition, it just means somebody that understands wine and is, works at a restaurant that serves it. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be certified or take the tests to be a sommelier. And I think the public misunderstands that, particularly with the movies that are out. But this, the idea of somebody that has knowledgeable enough in wine to recommend at a restaurant something you'd like based on your profile and what you asked to tell them is a very important feature of, of that service. Uh, I don't do it that way. I mean, I certainly sit on and chew on a wine and expose those things. Mm. And even yesterday when I was sat with these guys for lunch, felt like I was not as knowledgeable because that's what they like to do. They like to understand it's their hobby. the guy yeah. and who behind it. And I prefer to understand the wine yeah. and what it brings to the table, not, you know, if the guy's married that made it. I don't, it doesn't matter to me. So, uh, and my business is slightly different because I'm a consumer advocate for wine. In that I taste everything that they see on the shelf, which is a subject we haven't gotten to yet, which is about the fact that the shelves now are being stocked with almost like toothpaste, right? If you want that front center eye level spot, it costs you money, right? It's just like putting Crest in the perfect spot. It's not at the bottom of the shelf, right? We exactly. know this. And so, there's a few very powerful companies that right. control. That's what it is. And now that's why the shelf at Ralph's looks like the shelf at Vons, looks like the shelf at Stater Brothers. It's all the same stuff. But so my job as as a wine person is different is is defined differently and it's defined based on what my dad set out to do when he started this company because it was really to help clients who walked into his, this store, and his stores in Palos Verdes, very fluent area, many 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 um, aerospace engineers and v v VPs and presidents that worked in the El Segundo area for Raytheon and Boeing and all those guys that were there. Uh, the wife or the husband would come in, or we're having the boss over for dinner. We only have five bucks. Not 1975, okay, five bucks. <laughs> uh, what do we serve? And so his job was to sort through all the stuff that was not on the shelves because there really weren't shelves back then as much and choose good valued wines that he knew they would like. So it wasn't an attempt, which is most club based businesses or mail order businesses like mine, it wasn't an attempt to sell more bottles. Mm -hmm. It was an attempt to help the client pick the best value and actually was one of the first guys if not the first guy in LA to make you serve him the wine to taste before he bought it nothing was on the shelf that he didn't taste in those days you walked in if you had Mondavi or Hess or whatever was you hey this Hess you just put it on the shelf right but we didn't do that so my job is to take all the $20 cabs and all the $40 cabs and say that one's worth five and that's worth 50 mm -hmm. it's a little bit different than understanding you know, the marital status of the winemaker and, you know, his path, which is important because I think it's important to know that stuff because it, it is ultimately reflected in the wine. Your history, when you become, when you're doing this full time and you're done with employee benefit stuff, right, is going to be, wow, I started my garage and then I started making wine at, at the wine foundry at 900 mm -hmm. cases. Now I'm doing 10,000 cases. That whole history is, in my opinion, is part of the terroir of the wine. Yeah. It's reflective in there. It's part of that because it's your philosophy. It's your experience. It's not just what the soil was and what, in my opinion. All right. Ripple. Do you know what Ripple is? I think Are you that, too young? I think that's the, the stuff that people used to drink a lot of time ago. Yeah. Is that cheap wine or something? <laughs> yes. It was, you know what it is, Steve? Yes. Steve knows what it is. It's Ripple. It's, uh, it was uh, Boone's Farm. It was, uh, uh, what's the other one? Bottles and James, which was the, the uh, 
wine mixer. Um, oh, I do remember California Strawberry Coolers, fl- the, the two liter. Yeah. Remember so those two liter things? You are that younger. You are too young for this. I'd sl- you'd slip them in your coat and sneak them into the movie yeah, theater right. with you. Yeah. That's the one. Yeah, I wonder and what Ripple that stuff was, tastes like now. So <laughs> when I moved my business here the first time in Monrovia, I was uh, I was told <laughs> by the chief of police. First of all, he's told me when I walked in his room, I don't want you here <laughs> in this town. I'm like, geez, welcome. So <laughs> Very warm. <laughs> so when I got my license, he said, uh, no food. And that meant no Doritos. He said, no um, non-grape-based wines, which meant no Ripple, no Boone's Farm, no fortified wines, except for premium port, which meant no Thunderbird, which was Gallo's lead product at the time, and um, and no um, uh, no beer, which meant no suitcases, you know, no food. Thing. But that was that was it. So it was Ripple that thing. Um, vinegar, delicious, unless it's in your wine. Yeah. Do, <laughs> <laughs> oh, the reason I brought that, I use that word is <laughs> is. Um, I think most people think that wine automatically turns to vinegar. Uh, no, no, it, it doesn't. So um, uh, basically, and this is something you have to look at. Uh, in winemaking, we look at what they call the VA, uh, volatile acids. Um, and it's if, you, if your practices are, are not clean, if your, your cellar is not cold enough, if you don't maintain a high enough level of potassium metabisulfite, you know, there's a chance that you can get uh, VA, uh, volatile acids, um, acetic acid, and uh, that's really bad for your wine. Yes. <laughs> it, it can be treated, um, but that's a pain. Um, now, in terms of vinegar in general, I make vinegar as well, and uh, I love a fine wine that made in a vinegar. Made in a vinegar, it's delicious. So there's so. a couple things with that. So you're right. Um, people don't understand. Everybody thinks that wine turns to vinegar automatically. No. They, they, most of these wines on the shelf will just turn bad. Yeah, they, they oxidize turn, over yeah. a long period. They won't of time. turn to vinegar because yeah. the, the volatile acid has to be there. Yeah. The, that bacteria has to be there mm-hmm. to create the vinegar, which mm-hmm. you probably add to make vinegar. Yeah, but I don't think people understand that balsamic vinegar is not. Wine vinegar. No, it's fruit. It's, it's fruit, fruit, fruit juice. juices in a different times right. of barrels, right? It's basically, uh, I think Trebbiano is the main grape for balsamic vinegar. But it's interesting that that we the commercial balsamic vinegar is just a mixture of red wine vinegar and flavoring things. Really bad, hard to hard to because real vinegar that you make, yeah. is so much better than. Oh, it's it's delicious. And by the way, and for 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 anyone listening to this, it's really easy to make. Um, all you need to do is go online, find somebody that sells a mother. It's probably cost you about 10 bucks for somebody to ship. That's like a starter. Yeah, just a little starter. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, probably 10, 15 bucks to get that shipped to you. And, uh, you typically just, uh, throw a a bottle of wine and then a half a bottle of either white vinegar or water. And then you throw the mother in there. And then, you know, when you have leftover wine, yeah, which we don't have a lot, but <laughs> when you do have a leftover wine, you just pour that in there and it needs to be in like a crock or a glass container with a cheesecloth on top. Throw it under your sink and it's delicious. How long does it take? Uh, a couple months and, and you get a sure. good vinegar. Does it continue to, or does it burn itself out eventually? The mother? No, no, starter. the mother will keep on going. You just, you know, we, we harvest some or, you know, yeah, give right. some to friends and sometimes it becomes too much mother. It keeps on replicating, so we'll give some away. Yeah. So it's an easy little thing to do that will uh, take your cooking another level. The stuff at the grocery store is lousy. It's terrible. Yeah. It, you, just can't, you can't use that. My, my daughter's a baker. She brings home sourdough starter that she's been oh, carrying yeah. around. Like she puts it on the plane. <laughs> it's like, how do you even get allowed to do that? They probably think it's some kind of like bomb you know it's like this growing thing uh, anyway so um, yeah, we, we have a starter going right now right now at home my wife felicia <laughs> has been trying to perfect her sourdough really there's nothing like it that's no, so much better <laughs> nothing like it so much better um sulfur dioxide is sulfur dioxide for the necessary yeah so there's a movement about these natural quote-unquote natural wines and like i said we're running out of time actually but it's a whole other conversation I wanted to have with you. Maybe we'll do it again. Um, but the idea, and I find it's, it's a po- we're poking holes. Most of the industry is just poking holes in these comments that are being made by these guys that are trying to sell the idea that natural wines are biodynamic or organic. They're not going to get a hangover. They're not going to stain your teeth. All these wonderful benefits, health benefits to drinking wines otherwise. But they, they do hedge the idea of sulfur because sulfur comes from fermentation anyway. And I think what they've sort of 
fooled the public into thinking is that um, they've now used a metric of 75 parts per million as anything lower than that as basically low sulfur. But most wines that are made like yours are the free sulfur, probably lower than that. Yeah, we're, we're typically bottling in the, I would say, the low 30s. Yeah. yeah. So I think in the early days of winemaking in California, and it was just to dose, dose it up. And, and I don't think, I think the people have to understand that, you know, no winemaker is going to give up a crop of grapes when they bring it in, when it starts to see mildew and not sulfur it to make sure that they get a crop. They're not going to throw away a crop away in, in lieu of making sure this sulfur level is at 50 or 30 or whatever the number is, right? Yeah. But it seems to me that the number 75 parts per million is a pretty high threshold to have to worry, not to worry about them, really, when it comes down yeah, to Yeah, I mean, typically at that level, I think anything over about 50, it, you know, people can start um, noticing it. Right. And... Yeah. Uh, uh, so that would be, yeah, that would be a, a pretty high level. Yeah, I, mean, high, you know, high. I mean, sulfur, I don't know a lot about making a wine without any sulfur. I know that's uh, challenging. It is challenging. Um, but I mean, I, I want to say years ago, you may remember this, I think in, um, I don't know, a couple hundred years ago in France, they had a, a bounty out uh, that they would pay somebody a million francs or, or whatever it was if they could find a replacement for sulfur. Yeah, right. And uh, supposedly no one ever well, they, claimed they, that. They but. originated in the first place. Exactly. Uh, I forgot the com- accompanying chemical, but um, yeah. they started it, right? Yeah. So. And, I mean, there are some people, I, I think it's about 1% of the population that has uh, a sulfur intolerance, and it can cause problems. Yeah, but, but there's, they've, you know, but they've, that's very few, you know. I mean, most of the books you read, like the Mediterranean lifestyle stuff, that there's never been a recorded uh, anaphylactic, what's the term, anaphylactic reaction to sulfur. And if you go to Sizzler yeah. and go to the salad bar <laughs> or eat an egg, you're, if you eat two eggs, you're getting as much sulfur you know, you would have in a glass of wine anyway. So it's really a non-issue. But people think it has some health value. Well, I think a lot of times it's the other things, and especially in the red wine, that will sometimes cause my wife has can have a little mild allergic reaction well, it's a histamine to that exactly and you take a brandle girl you'll be fine yeah. but it's just like she'll, she'll get like a little sneeze and and that's not the sul- sulfur but a lot of times it, the no. sulfur is is blamed i tell people uh benadryl is an antihistamine yeah. red wine is a histamine it yeah. will aggravate it can't aggravate mm-hmm. all right last term wine of the month club <laughs> uh, this is a good one and we we confirmed this today that's right um Yesterday, uh, when we spoke, um, I said, you know, I think I was in that club once because I, I've only ever been in a single club. Yeah, which I've is never cool. Been in Very a, cool. I don't, I've never been in a winery wine club, never been in a wine of the month type club. And we checked it on the computer this morning. And in fact, uh, in the late 90s, I was a member of the club. So I'd say it's the greatest, it's, the greatest of all. I, I why, really, why would have I have chosen it? <laughs> I, actually, I should have introduced you as previous member. Previous now member. turned winemaker. <laughs> and I really thought when you signed up back then, I was going to retire soon because of you know, the volume of purchasing. But it didn't work out that way. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's been a great... <laughs> It's been a great pleasure, Rob, having you here. I hope we can do it again. Uh, the Pinot Noir, we're going to bring in for that. You saw on the way in, my manager was looking for Pinot. Yeah. And so we'll bring it in for that. Uh, I, have a, I have a group of people that only want California Pinot Noirs. I call it the Pinot Noir Exclusive Club. They only allow California wines. I get, ship them four cases a year. And uh, it's uh, November, December, and February, and March. Okay. And then they go dormant for the rest of the year. And then back in November, I start up again. And they're complete Pinot Noir aficionados. I have to include um, one of their choices, which is going to be like Radio Couteau or Sea Smoke or one of those kinds of things. And then I get literary license for the other three. Nice. So I look for fun things. So we'll bring that in for that. But it's a great pleasure having you here. And I hope to see you again soon. <laughs> I would love to. Thanks Cheers. so much. Thank Appreciate you. it.